Since its discovery in Jamaica, bauxite has become an important part of our economy. It's the largest non-service industry in Jamaica, and in fact, it is the third largest foreign exchange earner behind remittances and tourism. Amidst this seeming success are a myriad of complaints from communities adjacent to the sites mostly based on environmental concerns, for example, decrease in air quality, noise pollution, domestic water contamination, just to name a few, and recently a possible threat to the cockpit country. This is episode three of my new developments in Jamaica series, and in today's video, I will be tracking the progress of bauxite mining in Jamaica throughout the years, based on news articles and other resources. I will end the video with the most recent developments and my thoughts. If you enjoy these types of videos, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment. Let's get into it. The word bauxite is derived from the name of the French village, Le Bon de Provence, where bauxite was first discovered in 1821 by geologist Pierre Berthier. In 1827 and again in 1869, geologists noted its presence right here in Jamaica, evidenced by the red ferruginous earth. They, however, did not realize its importance. Not yet, at least. You see, bauxite and aluminum are inextricably linked. Aluminum is made through an extensive process of refining the bauxite ore to release aluminum oxide, otherwise known as alumina, which then goes through a heating and melting process called smelting to extract pure aluminum. A significant portion of Jamaica's bauxite goes to the refinery and is turned into alumina and then exported. The remainder is exported as is, unrefined. Because aluminum is strong yet lightweight and malleable, conductive, resistant to corrosion, and most importantly, recyclable, just to name a few of its properties, it has been used in the production of a wide range of things. Aluminum is used in the construction and transportation industries, in electrical work, and the manufacturing of consumer goods. In World War II, there was increased demand for aluminum, so much so that the British even resorted to using utensils collected from households to make aircrafts. But even with this increase in demand, ore bauxite was not exported to be used in the war. Nevertheless, all of three companies from North America, namely Alcan, Kaiser, and Reynolds, came to Jamaica for this red Gold. Jamaica's first shipment of bauxite was executed by Reynolds Jamaica Mines on June 5, 1952. That's a few months short of 70 years ago. Within five years, Jamaica would rise above every other bauxite producing country to become the top producer of bauxite in the world producing almost 5 million tons. This apparent success led Alcan to open another refinery at Ewerton St. Catherine in 1959, its second in Jamaica. By 1961, Alcoa began bauxite mining in Jamaica, making it the fourth such company at the time. The increase in bauxite production also led to an increase in the production of alumina, with both of Alcan's refineries producing an excess of 1 million tons annually. 1969 saw Kaiser, Reynolds, and Anaconda through Alpart opening a new plant at Nain St. Elizabeth. Jamaica's fourth alumina plant was built at Magotti St. Elizabeth by Rivera Copper and Brass in 1971. In that same year, Jamaica would lose its position as top bauxite producer in the world to Australia. In 1973, Jamaica's fifth refinery was opened in Clarendon by Alcoa. But before the start of the next decade, the West African country Guinea would also surpass Jamaica in the production of bauxite. Over the years, Brazil, China, and India would eventually follow suit. 
As recent as 2018, the top producers of bauxite were Australia, China, Guinea, Brazil, and India in that order, with Jamaica coming in at sixth place. When it came to alumina production, we were also ranked sixth place. I was unable to find more up-to-date information on this, unfortunately. Presently, bauxite mining takes place in the parishes of St. Elizabeth, St. Anne, St. Catherine, Manchester, and Clarendon. According to the Jamaica Bauxite Institute's website, these are the bauxite and alumina companies operating in Jamaica. Noranda Jamaica Bauxite Partners II, which was originally known as Kaiser Jamaica Bauxite Company. The government of Jamaica owns 51% of it. They currently have a permit from the government to continue mining bauxite in Jamaica until 2030. Their mining operation is located in St. Anne. However, a significant amount of what is mined is shipped to their refinery located in Louisiana, where it is turned into alumina. In 2019, Noranda released a public statement to clear up certain misconceptions about it conducting bauxite mining operations in the Cockpit Country Protected Area, CCPA. In this 2021 article, it was reported that Miranda Jamaica Bauxite is rebranding with a new name, Discovery Bauxite, and its U.S. operation would now be Atlantic Alumina. The rebranding will be done in stages. In 2022, there are still complaints regarding Naranda's mining close to the cockpit country, with some arguing that the area being mined is within what has always been known as the cockpit country. More on that and on the cockpit country later. There are currently three refineries in Jamaica, namely Alpart, Jamalco, and Wendalco. The government of Jamaica has 45% interest in Jamalco. Over the years, Alcoa Minerals of Jamaica, in a sense, became Jamalco. According to their website, Jamalco is a joint venture between Noble Group and Clarendon Alumina Production, CAP, with a focus on bauxite mining and alumina production. The Noble Group acquired Alcoa in 2014, and CAP is owned by the government of Jamaica, as I alluded to earlier. Jamalco's alumina refinery plant is located in Clarendon, and their bauxite mining sites are located in South Manchester, on the Mount Oliphant Plateau, and in Harmons Valley. On August 2022-2021, a fire broke out at their Clarendon refinery, leading to operations being suspended. In this March 2020, article, it was reported that operations are expected to resume by June 2022 and that the plant will be reconstructed in three phases. In 2016, the Chinese company Jisco took over Alpart and reopened their refinery in 2017. This is after it was closed in 2009 because of the worldwide financial crisis. Two years after reopening, they closed once more to do some upgrades. The March 6, 2022 Observer article, Jisco Alpart wants to mine more land in St. Elizabeth, reported that the company's plan to modernize their main plant was rescheduled because of the present world crisis. However, since then, they have made adjustments to the plan and are now in conversations with the government of Jamaica to locate potential bauxite mining opportunities. Their eyes are currently set on 700 acres of land in the Essex Valley area. Now on to Indalco. West Indies Alumina Company, Windalco, is owned by Rosal. According to their website, they own Euroton and Kirkvine Alumina refineries, bauxite mines, Esquivel shipping port, and farms in Manchester and St. Anne. In 2009, operations ceased at both Kirkvine and Euroton Works, with Euroton Works reopening in 2010. In this March 2022 article, Windalco Workers Worried, it is reported that workers are uncertain of what will happen as a result of the new sanctions placed on Russian oligarch Oleg Deripaska, who is the head of Rusal. United Company Rusal has headquarters in Russia and was founded by Deripaska. 
At this point, I want to segue into the discussion about the cockpit country. Where is the cockpit country? The hilly interior of Jamaica is called the cockpit country. It is characterized by hill and valleys. The area has a lot of limestone and as it rains and the water flows, the limestone erodes to create the distinctive pits of the cockpit country. It is home to rivers, caves, and the maroon town of Acompo, located in the parish of St. Elizabeth. In the 18th century, the cockpit country became a refuge for the ex-slaves as they escaped the colonizers. Its terrain and seclusion makes it the most rich and diverse ecosystem in Jamaica. In addition, 40% of our fresh water comes from the cockpit country. However, its exact location has been disputed for some time now. There seems to be many interpretations as to where the boundaries lie, with some having it only in one parish, while others have it spanning across up to six parishes. It is this lack of consensus that made the discussion of where not to mine difficult. As such, the government of Jamaica decided to define the boundaries and designate a protected area, something that should have been done a long time ago. In 2017, Prime Minister Holness announced the chosen boundary for the Cockpit Country and the Cockpit Country Protected Area, CCPA, which includes approximately 74,726 hectares comprising of forest reserves and important ecological and hydrological features and cultural and heritage sites though this map shows that some of those sites were left out of the protected area in this article where is cockpit country Kimon thompson reported that doctors dale weber and claude l noel of the university of the west indies had recommended in their technical report published in 2014 that the official boundary for the cockpit country should be comprised of a core a transition zone and an outer boundary this was after they hosted many town hall meetings and public consultations on behalf of the government the purpose of these distinctions i suppose is to have an extensive buffer zone to protect the area's flora, fauna, and water. In my research, I came across an article on the Mona Geoinformatics website written by Dr. Paris Luai Jr., whose proposed boundary, which was completed as part of his PhD in 2005, was recognized by the cabinet as the boundary for the cockpit country. In the article he wrote, I quote, My boundary of the cockpit country was one of the outcomes of my PhD thesis, which specifically focused on the diagnostic properties of cockpit karst, that is, defining what is and what isn't cockpit karst. As the type area of cockpit cars, it stands to reason that the very definition of the cockpit country is identifying which areas are continuous cockpit cars and which areas are not, the latter not being included within the cockpit country. Karst is basically what I mentioned earlier when describing how the pits in the cockpit country were created. Here is a definition. Landscape underlain by limestone, which has been eroded by dissolution, producing ridges, towers, fissures, sinkholes, and other characteristic landforms. So, based on my understanding of what he's saying, the name cockpit country is in reference to a particular type of landscape characterized by the features mentioned above, and so his boundaries only take into account such areas. But there are also other ways of defining what constitutes the cockpit country. For example, factoring into account what has historically been considered as the cockpit country by people living in and around the area. In addition, any defining of the cockpit boundaries must include any area that has important flora, fauna, and water that should be protected whether or not the area has cockpit karst. It is interesting to note that of all the proposed boundaries to the cockpit country, it is the one that has the smallest area that the government chose to recognize. Of course, an environmental impact assessment, EIA, needed to be done in order for NEPA to decide whether or not to grant a license to mine in the special mining lease, SML 173. They ended up rejecting the assessment all of four times before accepting the final assessments. The important parts highlighted in the final EIA 
are that within SML 173, there is no area with water above ground and any water underground is all of 100 meters below the surface and they will not be digging that deep. Another important part of the landscape are caves and sinkholes which actually carry water underground and according to their findings, almost all of those caves will not be mined. So apparently, a few will be mined. Their conclusion is that it is highly unlikely that the underground water will be contaminated. The report also lists biological impact referencing the different species in the area, the socioeconomic environment such as the types of communities close by and how they feel about bauxite mining taking place nearby. It also lists the impacts and of course mitigation. The report actually pointed out the potential financial benefits to the country if the lease was to be granted, with earning potential estimated at US $150 million. Is this after operational cost? plus the cost to mitigate against any negative impacts? Is this an objective analysis and does it take into account not only the financial benefits, but weigh them against the cost to the environment and the people within the vicinity of these sites? There are so many different sides to this that it would require a whole video by itself. I implore you to do your own reading. All my sources are listed in the description box. There is so much to discuss, so let me know what you think in the comments. Of course, if you're interested in having a look at my developments in Jamaica series, one of the videos I did was tracking oil in Jamaica from 1924 to 2022. I will link that in the description box below and in the comments and you can check it out after.